Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you that you're bringing revelation. We're taking hold of it, being a doer of it, and we thank you it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the important understanding of the true doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the fulfillment of Pentecost through Jesus Christ in the church age, the Holy Spirit at work to accomplish what he purposes and to bring forth the glorious church. We also talked about the working of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the working of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. We talked about praying in tongues. And we've talked about the fact that we are to be led by the Holy Spirit. We talked about that, the principles that are important and overcoming that which would hinder us and also the, the results of being led by the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to talk about the subject of hearing and obeying the voice of the Lord, which is of a necessity if you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's in the Old Testament. Variety of ways, variety of times. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The last days is the church age, which is what we are in now. How does he speak to us? Not by the Old Testament prophets anymore. Now it's by the Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In the Old Testament, they spoke by a variety of ways. If you look through the Old Testament, you see God speaking lots of ways. Speaking directly to them, speaking through angels, spoken out of a midst of fire, spoke from off the mercy seat, spoken a vision, a dream, thundered powerfully from heaven with a mighty roar. He spoke out of a cloud, spoke with a still small voice, and he speak directly from heaven. A variety of ways. Now it says, in the last days, he speaks by his Son. And who is that? That is Jesus. And who is he? He is the Word. How is he speaking to us? According to the Word, which is the Word of the New Testament, which is spiritual law, which is that Word of the covenant that we have come into as we have received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior in the New Testament era. We see in John chapter 14, not only does he speak to us by his son, through his son. But the way this works is through the Holy Spirit who takes that which Jesus speaks to him and he relays it to us. He does several things. John 14, 26. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He's going to teach you the things of God and bring spiritual revelation to you of the spiritual laws of God, the spiritual ways of the law of the Lord. He's also going to bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. As he takes the word and he writes it in your heart and he writes it in your mind, he's going to bring revelation of this unto you. Remember, the Holy Spirit will always testify of the things of Jesus. John 15, 26. When the Comforter has come, whom I will send to you from the Father, it's the Spirit of the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. The Holy Spirit is going to testify of Jesus because remember, we're being spoken to by the Son through the Word of God. It's all coming from Him and then through the Holy Spirit to us. We see this again brought forth. John chapter 16, verse 13. These are scriptures we've looked at. Howbeit when He... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. That means you and I can know all truth. The Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. He says, for he shall not speak of himself. That is an important point. He does not originate things. He simply relays what he hears. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Because remember, how are we being spoken to? By the Son, which is the Word of God in these last days. So whatever he hears, he's going to speak, and he's also going to show you the things to come or the coming things. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So in the New Testament now, he's speaking through the word of God, through Jesus who is relaying these things and giving them to the Holy Spirit who relays them unto us. We also see he still does speak through angels in the New Testament. 
Acts chapter 8. We see over here in verse 26 an example. Here's where the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, and the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So angels will also be used to relay the same things and to speak things as well. He's primarily going to speak, though, through the Holy Spirit because he comes to dwell on the inside of us. And he's going to bring, uh, speak to us directly from on the inside of us. Now, there's conditions for us to hear the voice of the Lord. <coughs> and we're expected to be able to hear and to obey the voice of the Lord. Conditions for hearing are important. Many people, they want to hear the voice of the Lord, but they don't hear the voice of the Lord. There's reasons why. They haven't met the conditions. Others think they're hearing the voice of the Lord, but they're not hearing the voice of the Lord. They're hearing other voices. Again, because they haven't met the conditions. In John chapter 10, verse 3, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The sheep hear his voice. Who is a sheep? Someone who is following the Lord closely, following the shepherd closely, not one who's wandering around doing whatever he wants. He has got his eyes on the Lord. He's following him very closely as you see a sheep out in the field right on the heels of the shepherd. So you and I must be a sheep. Of course, that means you have, must be born again and you must be following the word of God because, of course, he's going to speak to us through his word. Verse 4, when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Notice this, the sheep know his voice. God expects us to know his voice. We are to know his voice. It's not a difficult thing. We can know his voice, but we've got to meet the condition. If we're not a sheep, we will not know the voice of the Lord. And it's interesting when it says here about this knowing, this actually is in a perfect tense. The perfect tense speaks of action that has been completed in the past with present effects at the time of speaking, which really means that they have known his voice, as Young's brings out. That meant, means they have known it in the past and it continues on in the present. Otherwise, it's been an ongoing lifestyle for them. They've learned the voice of the Lord in the past because they've been following him closely and they continue to know it. That is where God's going to bring you to. He wants you to hear the voice of the Lord and to know it and continually. A stranger will he not follow, but will flee for him. Flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. A stranger is any voice that's apart from the word of God. It could be anything out there, anything from the world, anything from the flesh, anything that's trying to pull you in different directions, anything that is not of the Lord, it is a voice of a stranger. You don't want to hear it. The world's got all kinds of voices out there that will shout at you for all kinds of things. And some things don't seem like they're evil or bad. Nonetheless, they're not the voice of the Lord. It's not you being a sheep. They flee from him, it says. We don't want to hear the voice. We want to hear the voice of the Lord. For they know not, Again, this word here, again, we see the perfect tense showing the fact that this is action completed in the past with present continuing results at the time of speaking. Again, translated, have not known the voice of strangers. We don't want to know the voice of strangers. If we've not known the voice of strangers, that means we put them away and we keep them put away. It's not like we're hearing the voice of a stranger one minute and then we're hearing the voice of the Lord the next. You're not going to hear the voice of the Lord. Whatever you have heard and what you are hearing consistently will be the key. You need to be hearing the voice of the Lord and you need to be away from the voice of strangers. Absolutely. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. When it talks about knowing the sheep, it's ongoing. This means that Jesus, who is the good shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep, he is knowing you continually. Now, why would he be knowing you continually? Because you're walking in his ways, you're fellowshipping with him, you're doing his word, you're hearing his voice and doing what he says. And I'm also am known of mine. Again, the present tense, better translated, and am being continually known of mine. Otherwise, this speaks of a personal, intimate, 
fellowship with the Lord on an ongoing basis. That's what God wants for every one of us. We should be hearing and continuing to hear the voice of the Lord and walking in His ways and knowing Him. He's knowing us and we are knowing Him. Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice. Again, the one who's the sheep walking closely to Him and He's continually hearing my voice. Remember, He speaks to us in a lot of ways. He speaks to us through the Word primarily because that's the way He speaks. And he can bring it to us in a lot of different ways through the Holy Spirit, through the angel, different things. But it's all going to be in line with his word. And I know them and they follow me. When it speaks about them following, this is continually. This means if you're going to be in the position to hear the voice of the Lord, you can't be on and off with the Lord. You can't be on one minute and then next minute who knows where you are. You're watching some TV program or you're out there, you know, doing these other things or you got your mind on all these other worldly things, you know, who knows where you're going. No. You're continually tuned in to the Lord. That's why you've got to put away all these things of this world, all this media, this wasted time. It is just taking you down. It is sowing evil things into you. If you're not listening to things that are in line with the Word of God, it is not blessing you or prospering you or teaching you the things of God. And you're not, it's going to hinder you from hearing the voice of the Lord. Since I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. No one will ever pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave me is greater than all. No man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That's because we're walking with the Lord, continually following after Him. In John chapter 18. John chapter 18, verse 37. Here's where Pilate was speaking unto Jesus, and he said, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I'm a king. To this end was I born, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. That is an important statement. If you are of the truth, you will hear his voice. If you're not of the truth, you will not hear his voice. What is the truth? The word of God. If you're not hearing the Word of God, you're not going to hear His voice. If you are hearing the Word of God, you are hearing His voice, and you're going to be in a position to continually hear His voice. Because everyone that's of the truth, continually, present tense, means continuous, ongoing, repeated action, continually is hearing His voice. So this is another condition. We must be of the truth. And if you're of the truth, that's the Word, remember. The Word is the truth. But also, if you're of the truth, you're going to be doing the Word. Because look what it says in John 3, 21. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they're rotten God. God expects you to be a doer of the truth, a doer of the Word. So if you're of the truth continually, you're going to be continually hearing the Word, doing the Word, and you're going to hear and hear His voice continually as well. And by the way, doeth means ongoing action. Present tense again. It's not like I did it once and then I'm off doing other things later. No, this is your lifestyle. You are here and a doer of the truth, the Word of God. If you are not living that kind of life, you're not going to hear the voice of the Lord. You're going to be deceived by the enemy and you're not even a sheep. You're wandering off as a goat. A goat wanders off whichever way he wants instead of following the shepherd. The only way you can be following the shepherd is you're following what he says and your eyes are upon him continually. Another thing that's important in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 18 it's Samuel ministered before the Lord being a child girded with a linen ephod. He was ministering before the Lord in order to and then he would hear his voice as God would begin to speak to him. Notice this ministering before the Lord that means we're praisers and worshipers before him. Remember, when you praise and worship God, you get filled up with the Spirit, as well as prayer and through praying in tongues. And the filling of the Holy Spirit is for the influence of the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And He, will, of course, will bring revelation to us, lead us and guide us into all the truth, bring these things to our remembrance. And here He was girded with a linen ephod. Linen ephod is the white linen, and the linen, the white linen is the righteousness, because it speaks of the righteousness of the saints. So that means this speaks of one who's praising and worshiping God and one who is righteous before the Lord. 
That's what God wants. He wants us to be that type of a person. When we do that, we're going to be in the position to hear the Lord, because Samuel is one who heard the Lord, and he got the revelation of the fact that Eli, what he was doing, and what was and his sons, where the evil they were doing, and how he wasn't restraining his sons from the evil, and what was going to happen to him. The judgment was going to come upon him because of him not restraining his sons from the evil. Samuel heard the voice of the Lord. He ministered to him. He was righteous before him. That's what it's going to take if you are going to hear the voice of the Lord. Another thing that's important, we see it over in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. He's watching. He's paying attention. He's attentive. He's looking for him to speak to him. He's waiting on the Lord. That's what God wants. If you get so busy in so many things, you won't hear his voice. You need to be watching before him. You need to be watching to see what he might say before you, waiting before the Lord, keeping your eyes on him, thinking upon him, being God inside minded in the sense of listening to the Holy Spirit speaking to you of the things that he would want to bring revelation to you of. You want him to operate. Remember, he comes to walk in us, not only to dwell in us, but also to walk in us. That means he's going to function in us continually, step by step of everything in our life. This means you need to be attentive to watch and to listen to him. Many people don't hear him because they're so busy, they got their mind going 90 miles an hour on everything else. All they do is think their own thoughts. They're not tuned in to the Lord. That is a problem. We also see in Psalms 95, again, this points out the fact that we must be a praiser and a worshiper of God to come in, see the manifest presence of God by the filling of the Holy Spirit if we're going to hear his voice. Psalms 95, verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our Maker. God wants you to be a worshiper of him. Enter in. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, and he begins to speak about the hearing of the voice of the Lord. That's what God wants. Who's the guy that's in that position? One who's a praiser and a worshiper. He's in the presence of God. He's getting filled up with the Holy Spirit continually. This is quoted over in Hebrews chapter 3, in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice. Not the best translation here. The reason is because when we put the word, cursor over the word here, we find that this is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood expresses things that are contrary to fact, conditional statements, depending upon conditions being met. So it's not talking about whether you will hear his voice. It's talking about whether you might hear his voice if you meet the conditions as Young's brings it out, that you may hear, or even better with an aorist tense, that you might hear. If you might hear his voice because you meet the conditions. And the conditions are, you gotta be a sheep. You gotta be focused on the word. You gotta be of the truth. You gotta be praising and worshiping. You gotta be righteous before him. If you're walking in sin, you're not gonna hear anything at all. You gotta be attentive to him, being ready to listen to what he wants you to do. And then he goes on and he says, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, the day of temptation, the wilderness. The word harden here is also in the subjunctive mood, meaning a conditional statement, but it's all, this time it's in the present tense, which it literally would say, you may not be continually hardening your hearts. How could you harden your heart if you don't do what he says, and you ignore it, or you refuse, or you rebel? Those ones would harden his heart because they wouldn't obey his voice. They, they heard his voice, but they wouldn't obey. And any time you don't obey the voice of the Lord, you have actually hardened your heart against him. That's what they did. They were hardening their heart against the Lord. Big mistake. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, they do always err in their heart. What was their problem? Their heart was not right. That's why they didn't obey. Because they didn't obey, they hardened their heart. Unfortunately, 
of course, that cost them. They ended up dying out in the wilderness, being judged. They says they always err in their heart. And what's the result of erring in the heart? You will not know his ways. You will not know the ways of the Lord. That means that we must have a receptive heart to hear God, having met the conditions, ready to obey what he tells us to do. You want to hear the voice, are you ready to obey it? Not just hear it and then think about it. No, we should be ready to obey what he tells us to do. We cannot harden our heart towards God through disobedience. If you hear his voice and you harden your heart, don't obey him. He says you won't know his ways. You'll not know his ways because the ways of the Lord get revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. And what's the result of that? So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. That means you won't enter into the promises because entering into the rest is when you possess the promises of God in your life. Therefore, we must be sure that we are meeting the conditions, that we are receptive to hear His Word, we're ready to obey it and put it in operation so God will reveal His ways unto us. So as we walk in them, then we will possess the promises of God and enter into His spiritual rest. We come down to verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, again, if you might hear his voice again. You kind of lose it in the King James. It doesn't tell you. It's subjunctive mood again. If you might hear his voice, you might not harden your heart again, he says. You can't be doing this. That's why obedience is absolutely essential. God wants you to come to the place of being obedient in all things. If you want to hear the voice of the Lord, you don't play pick and choose with obey with God and think you're going to hear the voice of the Lord. You're kidding yourself. He's a holy God. He expects you to obey. If you obey consistently, have a track record, you're going to be in that position to hear the voice of the Lord. These guys, they didn't obey. Look what it says here. Some, when they had heard, they provoked them, howbeit not all that came out by Egypt by Moses, not everybody, but almost all of them, with whom was he grieved for 40 years. Was it not with them that had sinned? See, they hardened their heart and they wouldn't obey what God told them to do. What was the result? Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. Why didn't they enter into his rest? Because they disobeyed him. And God says to those that believe not, because you have to understand, belief is showing forth that you are doing what he says. Belief is predicated on obedience. If you obey, that shows you believe. If you don't obey, that shows you you don't believe. If you really believe God's word, you'll do exactly what he says. You'll obey and you'll carry it out and you will see God bring that forth. Otherwise, belief is not just mentally assenting and agreeing with it in my mind. It's shown in action by obeying and doing what the word says. We come over to chapter 4, verse 7. Again, in a certain, the limit of a certain day, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it said, today, if you'll hear his voice, Again, if you might hear his voice, you might not harden your heart. Same thing. For if Jesus had given them rest, now this throws people sometimes, because this is talking about the past, isn't it? Saying in David, if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not have spoken of after another day. The word Jesus is the same word for Joshua, and it means Joshua here. Young's corrects it. It means Joshua. It's talking about in the Old Testament. Joshua didn't lead them into having the rest. It's Jesus that brings us into the true rest. Then would he not have to have spoken of another day? Then he says, there remains therefore a rest to the people of God that you and I are to enter into and possess. The spiritual rest of God that we're to possess. And as we enter into this rest, it says in verse 11, let us labor or be diligent therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Why did they not enter in? Because they disobeyed. It comes down to obedience to the word is the key because when you obey his word, you will possess the promises and you will enter into his spiritual rest. And those ones who obey him are the ones who are hearkening to his voice. <clears throat> those are the ones who are going to hear his voice continually and they're going to enter into the rest that God has for them. So, your obedience is a critical. Too many Christians hear things, but they don't do it. Remember, he speaks to us through his word. 
As you hear the word, God expects you to hear and do it, hear and do it, hear and do it. Remember the guy who hears and does the, the word? He builds his house on, the, on the, the rock and attacks from the enemy. Don't even shake him. But the guy who hears the word and doesn't do it, he builds it on sand. The enemy's attacks come in and he has a great fall and he gets wiped out. Well, that's the difference. It's obedience, isn't it? Coming down to doing the word of God. Another condition that's important to realize is being a true disciple of the Lord. Only the disciples are really going to hear the voice of the Lord. Acts 9, verse 10. There was a certain disciple. I didn't say just a certain believer. He was a disciple at Damascus. What's a disciple? A disciplined one named Ananias. And he said to him, said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And here's where he began to tell him about Saul of Tarsus, where he was and how he was going to go and minister to him so he'd get his sight and how he was going to pray for him and he'd be filled with the Holy Spirit for the ministry that God was going to take him into. Notice, he heard his voice because he was a disciple. Well, who's a disciple? Are believers disciples? No. Look what it says in John 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, that's the condition, continuing, abiding, remaining in the word, then are you my disciples indeed. Meaning a disciple is one who continues in the word, not one who just hears it. So that would be what? One is a continual hearer and a doer of the word is a disciple. And of course, what happens then? That's the one who's going to know the truth, and the truth is going to make them free. What else shows evidence that you are a disciple? Not only that you're continuing the word, but that you have brought forth the fruit. John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So who are the disciples? The ones who are bearing much fruit. Well, how do you get to the place of bearing much fruit? It all's through the word of God working in you. We go back to verse 1. I'm the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he takes away, but every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. The fruit comes from the word that you are hearing and doing in your life. But before you come to the more fruit st stage, there's something that has to happen. There has to be a purging of that branch. Purging means a cleansing of it, a cleanse of all the filth and all the impurity. God expects us to get ourselves cleansed from all the sin, all the works of the flesh, all the evil spirits, everything that is impure. We're to get all of it out of our life. We're to be purged out. Then you'll be able to bring forth more fruit. But then as you go on, you come to the place down in verse 6. If a man abide in me, he's cast forth the branch withered, men gather him, cast him in the fire, and they're burned. And then he comes down to here, the one who, actually we skipped the one verse. It's the one here, verse 5. I am the vine, he the, the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Meaning, who brings forth the much fruit? The guy who's abiding in him. That means remaining, continuing, walking in his ways. So he's got fruit. He's got more fruit because he goes, goes through the cleansing process. And then he comes to the much fruit stage which is being a true disciple. So, those are the ones that are going to hear his voice. True disciples are those that continue in the word, bear much fruit, gone through the cleansing process. That's the one who was in a position to hear from the Lord. Ananias was a disciple, and that's why he heard from the Lord. It's also interesting. One who's seeking the Lord and putting him first place and doing everything is going to be in that position to hear the Lord. Cornelius, before he was even born again, was one who was seeking after God. In Acts chapter 10, we come to verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms, which is his mercy givings, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. So, he got God's attention. What was it about Cornelius of why he got his attention? Because of the fact that this is a guy who was praying, 
He was a guy who was fasting. He was a guy who was giving. He was a guy who was seeking after the Lord. And it's interesting the revelation that it actually brings because Cornelius then got, the angel told him to go and to send forth for Peter where he, where he was at in Joppa and tell him to come. And he was going to come and tell him words whereby they might be saved. And the gospel came to the Gentiles. It's very interesting, the revelation that's really here. He says, four days ago. What's so important about the four days? Well, that's significant. And also, it says the ninth hour. What hour? What, why does it matter what hour? Well, what happened at the ninth hour? That's when Jesus died on the cross, wasn't it? He's pointing towards the fact that Jesus had accomplished the redemption. And what about the four days? Four days until this time. Well, four days were a type of the 4,000 years that man was spiritually dead, just as it was four days before Lazarus was raised, not just from physical death, it's also pointing towards man being raised from spiritual death, from being dead for 4,000 years from the time of Adam until Christ. And here he's talking us precisely at the ninth hour. It's interesting. God points things out. 4,000 years, man's dead. The ninth hour, the very time when Jesus had died and then went down to hell to bring forth the redemption, we see he's praying at that, mount, that point in time. And so he hears his voice. This shows you the fact that someone who is praying, giving to God, seeking God, he's going to be in a position to hear from the Lord. You need to be praying, you need to be seeking God, you need to be a giver, you need to be involved in doing the things that God wants to do. He's fasting, he's praying, he's seeking the Lord. That's a person who's looking to receive from the Lord, get revelation. That's a person who's going to hear the voice of the Lord. Another thing we see, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is the church at Laodicea. It was declared to be lukewarm because they were only interested in earthly, temporal things. In Revelation 3.20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, if you might hear my voice, again, showing the subjunctive mood, the conditions got to be met. So you got to meet the conditions. That meant these guys would have to repent. They'd have to confess their sins, repent of their ways, get in the Word, start following the Lord, as they weren't, and open the door. And if he might open the door, this means, because this, again, is a subjunctive mood, might open the door to what? What's, he, what, what's the door? The door of his heart. He's knocking on the door of the heart. He wants to come in, and he wants to sup with them, to fellowship with them, and he with me. You're going to have to, first of all, of course, be right with the Lord, walking in His ways. You're going to have to meet the conditions to hear His voice. And you're going to have to open the door of your heart. You can't keep Him out. You can't have Him, we keep resisting Him. And we resist Him if we don't do what the Word says. We are supposed to give Him our heart. Have you given the Lord your heart? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. Look what he says. My son... Give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. If you give your heart unto the Lord that you're going to follow after him, he will bring revelation to you, and you'll start revealing his ways. You will get revelation. You'll begin to see and to observe the ways of the Lord. He wants to show you his ways. You see, we've got to get our mind on the things above. The problem with the church there at Laodicea, they were just all concerned about all the temporal things they were doing, and they, didn't, they weren't seeking after the things of God. Colossians 3.1, If you then be risen with Christ, meaning you're born again, what are you supposed to seek after? Seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. I guarantee you, you're not going to seek those things above out there doing worldly things and watching programs or movies or any of these kind of things that aren't, that aren't feeding you the things of the Word of God and bringing truth to you, that's for sure. Now, you're going to seek the things above anything. It's got to be in line with the Word. You're going to be in the Word of God, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection to have understanding on things above, not on the things on the earth. Again, outside of knowing what you need to do to function in life, you want to be seeking the things above. 
You want to learn heaven's ways. You want to learn the things of the Word of God and be hearing and doing the Word. If you're not in the Word and spending time seeking after Him, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> it's a waste. You're making a big mistake. You need to get tuned in. And I guarantee you, you won't hear the voice of the Lord. You might hear a voice, but it won't be the right voice. You'll be easily deceived by the enemy. Give your heart to Him. Open your heart to Him. Come to the place... Quit being focused on all these natural things. Some people get so, get so caught up with all the things that are happening in the country and the world and all these things. You need to be aware of them, but don't get your focus on them. Don't get all embroiled in all this stuff. You need to, it's good to be aware of it, but you get your eyes on the Lord and be doing the things that He wants you to do and work. see the work of God be accomplished in your life. Another thing that's going to be important, which goes along with this, is where your mindset is. Where is your mind set on? Is your mind set on the things above? Is it set on the things of the Spirit? Or is it set on all these fleshly things? Romans 8, 5. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That would be after the human nature, after the body, after desires, after what I feel, what I want to do, my desires. You have to deny yourself if you're going to follow Jesus, remember. He said the first thing, he said, deny yourself. If you haven't denied yourself, you're not going to hear his voice. You're going to hear all other kind of voices. You mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, they're minding the things of the Spirit. They're after that. They're going, they're going to be minding the things of the Spirit. That's what they're focused on. Wherever your focus is, is what you're going to be receiving from. Your mindset will be. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, well, how can you have a spiritual mind? It's on the Word. You're thinking the Word. You're studying the Word. You're hearing the Word. That's going to produce life and peace in you. There isn't enough time even in our life to go through and learn everything of the Word of God. There is so much to learn and so much revelation He wants to reveal unto us. We need to spend our time in the Word. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Why? It's not subject to the law of God, meaning your mind's supposed to be subject to the law of God. Is your mind subject to the law of God if you're doing all these worldly things? No. Your mind is to be subject to the law of God because you are submitted it unto the Word of God and you're doing what He wants you to do. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Well, does that mean I'm stuck? In my situation? No. We're to seek after His Word, and His Word reveals His thoughts and His ways. And the Holy Spirit takes that and writes it in our heart, writes it in our mind, so we will know His thoughts and know His ways. That's what He expects for us. We used to walk after our own ways. Hopefully you're not walking after your own ways again. Or you're making a big mistake in your life. Ephesians 2, 3 among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh. Lust is not really, a, um, it's okay, lust of the flesh, it's fine. Fulfilling the desires, I'm sorry, it's over here, the desires of the flesh. This word desires is the word thelema, which means will. It refers to your will. It's been translated will 62 times out of 64 uses. So pretty much you can tell it's talking about your will. So we all were operating the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the will of the flesh and of the mind. If you're walking after the will of the flesh and the will of the mind, what I want to do at my will, we're in a mess. You're not going to hear the voice of the Lord. That's what we used to do in the past. God wants you to set your will after the things of God. Remember what he says over in Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 2. I spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. What was wrong with them? Walking in a way that was not good. Why was it not good? After their own thoughts. That meant their mind wasn't on the things of the Word of God. If you're walking on things of what you want to do after your own thoughts, you're not walking in a way that's good. It may not be evil or sinful, in a sense, doing bad things, but nonetheless, it's not good in God's sight. 
and he calls those people a rebellious people. You and I are to walk after the ways of the Word of God. Another thing, you cannot be following the voice of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. It's talking about your spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The capital letter has been put in by the translator. There's none in the Greek. Your flesh, which didn't get changed, is lusting against. They're against the spirit, which did get changed. You got a new spirit. And the spirit against the flesh, they're contrary the one to the other. They are opposites. They are set against each other. They are adverse to each other. They're against each other. Your flesh does not want to do the things of God. That's why. What's the voice of the flesh? Your feelings. You can never follow your feelings. Oh, I don't feel like praying. Well, that's the voice of the flesh. Are you going to obey that? Are you going to obey the spirit that's always ready and wants you to get up and start studying, praying, and doing the things of God? You can't follow your feelings. If you follow your feelings, you're listening to the wrong voice. That's the voice of the flesh. We cannot allow that. Everybody has to watch that, but especially women, because you are emotional and you are feelings, and that's okay as long as you govern them according to the Word of God. You have, just like men, can't just operate off their mind. They've got to govern according to the Word of God as well. They're mental. Women are emotional. You have to govern your feelings in line with the Word of God. If you react out of your feelings, you're going to be in sin most all the time instead of doing what God wants. You can only react out of the Word of God to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. And certainly, you aren't hearing the voice of the Lord. You're hearing the voice of the flesh, which is going to lead with the devil, because it's going to try to get you to do things contrary to the Word. Another thing that's important, if you are going to be able to hear the voice of the Lord, is you must trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. We can't be trying to figure everything out ourselves. We just need to trust in the Lord, do what he says, and know that God is going to perform his word and his promises in your life. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. That means not some, not just when I have a problem. In all thy ways and he shall direct thy paths. If we meet the conditions, trusting in him, leaning not to our own understanding, acknowledge him in all our ways, he's promised to direct our paths. And remember, the steps are ordered by the Lord. The steps are not in man, it's God who directs the steps, showing us what we're to walk in, the path that you and I are to walk in. Another thing that's important, if you're going to hear the voice of the Lord, you do have to be in the flow of the things that God wants for you to do. And he's called you and I to be the army of the Lord, to fight the good fight of faith, to war good warfare, to conquer the enemy, to engage in warfare intercession, to cast out the devils, to be a, a warrior having put on the whole armor of God and conquering the enemy. In Joel chapter 2, we see over in verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. You and I are being raised up to be the army of the Lord. You put on the, the armor of God so you have the power of God resident within you so you can release it out with mighty force to conquer everything, to stand against the wiles of the devil, to cast down all those principalities, powers, release the darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, release the power of God, destroy the works of the enemy, conquer everything, quench every fiery dart, use the sword to smite the enemies, speak the promises into being. All those things are so important. You're a part of the army of the Lord. As you get the armor of God on, you get involved in the war, in the good warfare. The weapons of warfare, are, our weapons are spiritual weapons. In, we're engaging in a spiritual warfare against a spiritual enemy, the devil. Notice, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Who's going to hear his voice? The army. Who's not going to hear his voice? The one that is not involved in the army. Who's out there just doing whatever he wants to do. No, God wants us to be a part of of the army of the Lord. And the army of the Lord, what's about them? It says, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. That's the one who's a part of the army of the Lord, one who's a doer of the word. You'll never become a part of the army of the Lord and become strong and mighty 
and powerful if you're not a doer of the word. The one who is a doer of the word is strong. And that's the one that's going to hear the voice. In other words, if you do what he says and you get strong and you're in the flow of what God has and you're involved in the spiritual warfare and all the things that God wants you to do, understanding it's a warfare against the enemy in all aspects of life, therefore, you're going to hear his voice because he is going to speak to you and direct you in the army of the Lord to things he wants you to do. Think about what they did throughout the Old Testament. They were always fighting, and God would speak to them and always direct them and show them what they were to do. And they were going to go forth and engage the enemies and attack the enemies and destroy the enemies and overcome them and take the land, take the promises in your life is what that's speaking of. You're going to do the same thing. You are going to be hearing the Lord, and He's going to be leading you step by step to conquer in all the things you do. You're to conquer the enemies. You must engage in warfare. You must be a part of the army by putting on the whole armor of God and getting strong if you're going to hear the voice of the Lord. Over in Haggai, chapter 1. These guys were lazy. They just wanted to take care of their own self, build their own houses, and they didn't want to have anything to do with the house of the Lord. That's not time to do that. Well, they missed it. And God was correcting them through Haggai, telling them they had to get themselves right. It's back here. We can go back a little bit and we'll see it. He says, Is it a time, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? That was God's house. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Look at what look what's happening in your life. You sown much and bring in little. Oh, that's not prosperity. You should be seeing the multiplication of what you're sown. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, there's none warm. He that earns wages, earns wages, puts it in a bag with holes, it just runs out. Oh, well, there's no prosperity in all that. Looks like somebody's bringing a lot of destruction because they're not in the will of God, see? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Have you been doing what you're supposed to do? Just living a life unto yourself? No. Go to the mountain, bring wood, build the house. I'll take pleasure in it and I'll be glorified, saith the Lord. He's talking about the building of the house of God. We aren't building a physical house now, but what are we building? A spiritual house. The spiritual house of God has to be built in you. And he speaks about how my house was waste and you're running every man into his own house. They were totally selfish. You'll not hear the voice of the Lord if you have a selfish brand of Christianity. Remember, we're to deny ourselves first thing and live unto him. Therefore the heaven over you stayed from dew and the earth stayed from her fruit. No blessings. No fruit, drought upon the land, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil. They weren't prospering in all their work. Upon that which the ground bringeth forth, upon men, cattle, upon all the labor of their hands. No prosperity at all. That's because they weren't doing the things that God wants them to do. We've got to be engaging in doing what God wants. So, here is this one, Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. This speaks here. Zerubbabel, here the son of Jetiel, and Joshua, son of Jodic, the high priest, these ones. Notice it says, with all the remnant of the people. There was a remnant of the people who would listen. The rest of the people, they wouldn't listen. That's not all the people, just only a remnant would listen. Unfortunately, it's going to be the same thing today. God is raising up a mighty army, a mighty church, but it's only going to be a remnant because not everybody's listening. Not everybody will follow the way of the Lord. Only the few are following the way of the Lord. The many are going the way of destruction. The many are in trouble. They're going to be a part of the fallaway crowd. But the remnant of the people, and these are the ones that are going to be seeing God's blessings in their life. Notice what it says. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Those that are a part of the remnant, they're going to meet the conditions. They're going to be obeying the voice. They just didn't hear the voice. They obeyed the voice. See, when you hear it, God expects you to obey it. You don't just hear it and then just decide what I'm going to do. You do it. When you hear the word, do it. Hear and do. Hear and do. Hear and do. And you're always ready to obey. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, is the Lord that sent them. And the people did fear before the Lord. So it shows they had obedience to the voice of the Lord. 
They had the fear of the Lord, fear before the Lord. Verse 14, again speaking of the remnant, they came, it says, and they did work in the house of the Lord. So they started building the house of the Lord. What's the work that you and I do? Building the spiritual house of the Lord in us by hearing and doing the word of God so that you and I become strong and we get rid of all the ungodly stuff out of our house. Throw it all out. Cast all the devils out. Get rid of it all. So here, here he's got those who are coming, the remnant that are doing the work. If you're going to be one of the remnant, you're going to be doing the work of the Lord and carrying out what God wants you to do. We come down to chapter 2. And we come over to verse 3. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? What's this talking about? The first house was the early church. It did have glory manifest in it. But what do we see now? It's nowhere close to it. What do we see in the church today? We do not see a glorious church. Most of what we see is a church is going nowhere. Not, they won't even do most of the things of the Word of God. They're in so unbelief. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and strong, O Joshua, son of Josech, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. The ones who are the remnant are going to get strong. The ones who hear his voice and obey, remember, those are the ones who have the fear of God, and they get strong. And work, meaning they're uh, doers. It really is the word saw, which means to do. They are doers. Only the doers of the word are going to be a part of of the remnant. So the remnant, those are the ones who hear his voice. And they're the ones who are going to obey, have the fear of God, become strong, do the spiritual work in building the spiritual house of God, and they're going to be doers of the word. Now what's going to hinder you from hearing the voice of the Lord? There'll be a lot of things that can hinder you. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. He's not going to hear you. And, of course, if he's not hearing you, you've got to know you're not going to be hearing him. Your sins and iniquities will stop you. Of course, that's if you're walking in sin or unrighteousness or lawlessness, and we know that this is happening more and more in the body of Christ, unfortunately. It results in him not hearing you. He's not going to hear your, you. And, of course, you're not going to hear him either at the same time. That means we've got to deal with sin. Remember, a sin no, has no dominion over us. We now are dead to sin. Because we are dead to sin, we should no longer be living in it. We should be conquering all areas of sin in our life. And we can. We have absolute dominion. And we can walk in the ways of the Lord if we walk after the Spirit. Also, remember... In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 3, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables. Do we want to hear anything outside of the Word of God? No. Why are people teaching all, a lot of these things, especially from extra-biblical books that aren't even in line with the Word of God, that are fables, that are false? This is the problem. They don't endure sound doctrine anymore. They're looking for some great new revelation. Oh, those guys are going to be in trouble. All the revelations right there in the Word. The Holy Spirit will bring it to us. We need to keep studying and thanking Him for bringing it to us. Uh, they turn away the ears from the truth. Oh, they want to start hearing other things. we got lots of people that are listening to fables, things that are extra-biblical, that are false, that are not in line with the Word of God whatsoever. And this is the second Timothy. He would already told them back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, what's going to happen. The Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now you start listening to doctrines of devils, you're going to be out running all kinds of ways. You can be easily falling into fables and all kinds of things. Wrong teaching, fables, turning away from the Word of God, all these things are going to hinder you from hearing 
the voice of the Lord. Because the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is going to speak in line with the Word. He's not going to speak contrary to the Word. And remember, the Holy Spirit does not originate anything. Anything that comes will be in line with the Word of God. Therefore, we've got to have right doctrine. We've pointed that out so much in the past. Stop hearing wrong teaching. Stop hearing fables. Stop hearing anything that would cause you not to listen to the Word. Quit wasting your time listening to this stuff. It's actually sowing evil things into you. You have no business listening to anything like that. You will not hear the voice of the Lord if you are, get filled up with this. We see something in Isaiah, chapter 50. Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that's weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord has opened my ear. I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. So what does God want us to have? The tongue of the learned. But how did you get that? Learned means one who has been taught and discipled. One who has heard the word, been endure the word, become a true disciple. Otherwise, he's biding in the word. He continues in it. He bears much fruit, as we saw, what a disciple is. He's going to have the tongue of the learned because what's going to be happening? He's going to be speaking that which the Holy Spirit's going to be bringing up to his remembrance out of what's in him, and he's going to be speaking it forth. He's going to know how to speak a word in season to him that's weary. He's going to have the word of God, the answer that's going to bring truth to him and strengthen the person and help get him on the right path and bring him correction or help them that's weary in this situation. Because this one who is the learned one, who's in the word and disciple, he's going to be hearing he wakens my ear to hear as the learned. Because you got the word in you, he's going to be quickening the word, and you're going to be hearing him speaking to you. As he says, he's opened my ear. And he also says, I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Well, we can't be getting some revelation and then getting out and being rebellion the next minute. Oh, I've learned all these things, and I'm just going to kind of go off in this direction for a little while and listen to this or watch this, you know, and be rebellious. <laughs> turn away back, oh, you're in trouble. No, you can't be turning back. You're, you're going to be in not hearing the things of the Lord. We need to be sure that we are learned as one who's been taught. We become accustomed to doing the word consistently as a true disciple. No rebellion, no turning back whatsoever from the way of the Lord. Another thing that's important, we have to come out of all carnality. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. These guys were still babes in Christ. The word babes is the word nepios, infants. Infants in Christ, meaning that those that are still infants, they're carnal initially. They haven't come to the place of being spiritual so they can hear the spiritual things. He couldn't speak to these guys as spiritual because they had some, all this carnality in their life. That's a problem. I fed you with milk, not with meat. Hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. And what was part of the problem? For yet carnal. But whereas there's among you envy, strife, divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? You should not have envy and strife Arguments, all these kind of things, contention, divisions, dissension, all this kind of stuff, that shows carnality. That should not be happening in our lives. God wants you not to be walking as men out there in the world. He wants you to be walking as spiritual according to the Word of God. We're well, talking about the one who is the babe. Well, how do we come out of being a babe? What, what's going to cause us to grow up so we can get to the place of becoming spiritual, to be able to hear the Lord, be able to speak the things He wants to, instead of us being a carnal state where we can't hear things because we haven't grown up enough to hear anything. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, He's telling them, you guys should be teaching. How come you're not teaching now? Well, if you're not teaching, obviously you don't have the Word in you. You haven't been doing it. You haven't got it to the place of where you're op operating in your life and you, you're working it out. You can know it so well, you can teach it to others. That's where you should be at. 
You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, but are become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Well, who needs milk? Babies do. They haven't grown up yet. It's amazing how many Christians have been Christians for a long time and they're still like spiritual babies. They haven't grown up. Years of being a Christian doesn't make you grow up. It's the word in you that makes you grow up of whether you have been a hearer and a doer of it. He goes on and says, Everyone that uses milk as a spiritual baby, a nepios, he is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a baby, a nepios. What's unskillful me? Inexperienced in the word of righteousness. So what's going to be the key? Becoming experienced in the word of righteousness. How do I get experienced in the word of righteousness? I hear it and I do it, and I hear it and I do it, and I hear it and I do it. Consistently hearing and doing the word is the key. Get experience in applying it and working it in your life. If you're not doing the word, you're still a nepios. You're going to be carnal. God will not be able to speak to you as he wants. Instead, strong meat belongs to those that are of full age, those that have come to maturity, gone on to perfection. And remember, the glorious church is the one that's gone on to perfection. If you're still in carnality, you'll never become a part of the glorious church. It's only the ones that have grown up that will become a part of that. Who, the, who, how did they get this way? Even those who by reason of use, the word use means habit. The habit. The habit of what? Hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing and hearing and doing the word. Consistently, consistently, day in and day out. It becomes your lifestyle. That is what God wants. The reason of habit, even have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. God wants you to get so filled up with the ways of the world, the way of the Spirit is like normal. It's the way norm normal. Everything is just, that's the way I function all the time, in the realm of the Spirit. That's the way we expect for all of us. If we're carnal, we won't hear from the Lord. If we're spiritual, it's because we've grown up and we will be able to hear from the Lord. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 and in chapter 3, here we see him speaking to the church. And he's telling them all the things that they need to know before the judgment comes on the church. Because the judgment is coming to the church first. And he's calling them, telling them, I know thy works, remember, in every one of those cases. And he's telling them the things that they'd done that were good. He's telling all the things that were wrong. They need to correct and get in order. And he says, if you don't correct them, there are going to be judgments that are going to come upon you in all those ones. Well, what was going on here? Verse 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit is speaking unto the churches. In fact, as we are going down these days, the Holy Spirit is going to be continually speaking to the churches to come in line and get right with the Lord because the judgment will come to the church before it comes to the world, remember. And the church has to get right. We need to hear. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And of course, what shows what's going on in your life? Your works. Remember in Revelation 2 and 3, the first thing he says to each one of them is, I know your works, I've known your works. Your works show forth who you really are. Are we hearing and doing the word? Do we have the works which brings forth the fruit in our life? And also, he told them how they need to correct all the things that were going on in their life. God expects us to correct these things. Well, we need to hear what the Spirit says. Is he speaking to you? Is he wanting to correct you on some areas in your life? Or are you just ignoring him and letting him go? You'll be in trouble. You're going down the road that will bring judgment. We have to correct everything and go on into perfection in the Lord. He wants us all to grow up and notice to every single one of those. At the end, he talks about, if you remember after this, he says, to him that overcomes, to the one who conquers and carries off the victory. So the Spirit is speaking to the churches, commanding them to listen. This is a commanding statement when it says, let them hear. It's really not the best. Instead, it should be say, say because it's an imperative mood, it should say, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, not let them hear. It's kind of a watered-down way. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Pay attention and listen. 
because this is what's going to happen. He was telling them they need to get, the, get everything corrected. And to him who overcomes, conquers, and carries off the victory, then we say all these tremendous blessings. And he's talking about all the things that are going to happen to us in the life to come. We're going to eat of the tree of life in the midst of paradise of God. And you go on and you see all the different ones that he talks about, how when they see all these great things, when he, oh, he conquers and overcomes, he won't be hurt of the second death. <laughs> well, that means he's going to make it. He's going to be saved. You know, and he goes on and he talks about in uh, verse 17, the one who overcomes, I'll give the eat of the hidden manna and give him a white stone and the stone of my new name written, no man knowing saves, he receives it. These are all things in the future. This is for everyone, and every one of these are here. Commands what the Spirit is saying under the churches. Every single one of them. And then we come down here. He that conquers and overcomes and keeps my work to the end, I'll give him authority. That's what it means, exousia, over the nations. Oh, yeah, that's talking about the millennial reign. Hey, these things are all important. We've got to hear what the Spirit is saying because He's always going to bring you to, to a place of walking right with Him and to bring correction as well as to show you the things that He wants you to be doing, walking in the ways of the Lord. Same thing when we come over to chapter 3. He every one He speaks, I know thy works, to each one of them. He tells the guy that conquers, the name of Sam will be clothed in white raiment. That's righteousness. And I'll not blow out his name out of the book of life. Uh, we don't want that, that's for sure. But I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. Him that conquers, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall no more go out. I'll write upon the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem. I mean, you're going to be in the New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. That's what God wants. We come down here in verse 21. To him that conquers, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne, ruling and reigning. And then we see one other scripture about this conquering in Revelation 21, 7. He that conquers and carries off the victory, shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. we got to conquer and overcome. And that's why he's saying, hear what I'm saying. He wants us to conquer and overcome everything. Because the Holy Spirit is always going to bring you to the Word of God. He will always point out things that he's teaching you, and what he wants you to do, and giving you revelation, and moving you forward in the things of God. He's also going to be directing you on what he wants you to do, expecting you to obey and hearken to his voice to accomplish what he purposes so you grow up in all things. He's also going to be correcting all the problems in your life. And if you don't take heed and correct those problems, you're in trouble. You've got to conquer and overcome all those things. And you can't just little, let's think those little things aren't going to affect you. The little foxes spoil the vine. All the things that are, ne that are negative have to be rooted out of your life. Absolutely. So we want to hear and obey the voice of the Lord. This is all being led by the Holy Spirit. To what? What he's going to accomplish, which is to raise us up to be the glorious church, the mighty army of the Lord, the conquering church that comes to holiness, that comes to the place of accomplishing everything that God wants to be the glorious church because the glory of God is going to be poured out mightily on the end time church. And you and I are to be a part of that. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the importance of hearing and obeying the voice of the Lord. I see God spoke a variety of ways in the Old Testament through the prophets in different ways and also through the angels. But I see in the New Testament, in these last days, He now speaks unto us through the Son, Jesus Christ, the Word of God. The Holy Spirit relays that which the Son speaks and makes it known unto us. I thank you for the conditions that are revealed in the Word that are necessary for me to hear the voice of the Lord, 
because I'm born again doesn't mean I'll hear the voice of the Lord. I must be a sheep following the Lord. I cannot be following strangers, but I will always be a sheep following the Lord, being a doer of the word. I will be righteous, hearing the word of righteousness, doing the word of righteousness, confessing all sin, turning away from all unrighteousness, being a doer of the word. I will also praise and worship, so I am filled with the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit. I will be attentive to watch and to listen, be focused upon hearing the Lord of what He wants me to do. I have a heart that's receptive, and I open up my heart to receive what He brings to me, and I'm ready to obey it. I will never harden my heart and disobey what God tells me to do. Or I will not know His ways, and I will not enter into His rest, or possess the promises of God. I also will be a disciple, a disciplined one, who continues in the Word, and is bearing much fruit, because I've gone through the cleansing process to bring forth more fruit, and I'm abiding in the Word to bring forth much fruit. I also will be a person of prayer, and in seeking God, and doing everything He wants me to do. So I'm in the place that I will hear the Lord. I will get my mind focused on the things above, not on the things of the earth. I will not have a fleshly mind. I will have a spiritual mind, renewed to the Word, the mind of Christ. I will not follow the voice of the flesh. I will not allow my feelings to dictate what I am doing. I will govern my feelings, and I will only follow what is coming from the Spirit and lie with the Word of God. I will also trust in the Lord with all my heart, acknowledging Him in all my ways, knowing that as He hears, He will direct my paths. He will show me what to do in every situation. I will also be a part of the army of God. I will be in line with what God's program is to put on the armor, get spiritually strong, walk in the ways of the Lord, have great power and strength manifesting in my life so that I will be mighty, a part of the army of the Lord, as I will hear His voice as He sends me forth to do His mighty works. I will be a part of the remnant who hear and obey His voice and walk in the fear of the Lord and become strong and build my spiritual house, getting strong spiritually, being a consistent doer of the Word of God. I will eliminate all sins in my life. I will make sure I do not follow any wrong teaching. No doctrines of devils are coming into me I will only follow the Word of God. I will be learned and have the tongue of the learned as I have been taught, and I will never turn back and be rebellious. I will also grow up by being a doer of the Word of Righteousness so I'm not a carnal, spiritual baby any longer, but I get experienced by hearing and doing the Word so I will hear His voice. I also will hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. I realize my works reveal who I am. I will hear and do the word. I will correct all things that are not of the Lord in my life. I will cast out all the devils. I will conquer all the sins. I will make sure that I'm walking in the way of the Lord. And I will conquer and overcome as I am hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church to raise up the mighty army of the Lord, the perfected church. I thank you that as I conquer, I will be ready for the millennial reign of Jesus and for the life to come. I will be with the Father and with the Son 
and I will inherit all things. For I will walk in the ways of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I set my heart, my mind, my will, my whole life. I deny myself. I set my life to hear your word and to obey your word and obey the voice of the Lord that the Holy Spirit brings to me, directing me in what I'm to do. I will be led by the Holy Spirit. I will be a son of God. And I thank you that this will happen in my life as I am led by the Holy Spirit and I will become a part of the glorious church, the holy church, the holy nation presented unto the Lord when Jesus comes back. Thank you for accomplishing this work in me. I will hear the voice of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, God's no respecter of persons. He just doesn't say, well, I'll do it for you, but you do all these things, it's not going to happen for you. That's not true. He'll speak to everybody. If you're not hearing, we need to get closer to him. Are you a sheep? Are you in the word? Have you gotten rid of all this stuff? Have you cleaned up everything? Have you gotten rid of all this filthiness and all this everything out of our life? Are we meeting the conditions? If we do so, we will hear the voice of the Lord. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. Thank you that we will be meeting these conditions, doing what your word says and hearing and obeying the voice of the Lord, being led by the Holy Spirit and seeing you accomplish everything that you purpose in our life. Thank you for this great work being done because we are hearers and doers of this word in Jesus' name.